Hello, and thank you for joining us for this World Council of Credit Unions virtual event, the Social Value Measurement Opportunity, building on credit union strengths to enhance impact through our ESG strategies. My name is Greg Newman, Director of Communications for World Council. Before we get started, please take a moment to click on the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and choose your preferred language. English or Spanish to make sure you can hear all of today's presentations. Tomese un momento para estar clic en interpretación y elija su idioma, inglés o español para asegurarse de, de que puede escuchar esta reunión en su idioma preferido. The best banking deals create value for a range of stakeholders through improvement in physical and mental health as well as enhanced well being. This is the type of banking offered by credit unions, and it represents a key opportunity for differentiation in financial services markets. The challenge is that measuring the social value of our work often understates uh, our performance. These limitations create an environment for credit unions where leveraging purpose and mission as strategic differentiators are underutilized. The good news is that there is work underway to change that. During this session, Keith Taylor, Executive Director of DUCA Impact Lab at DUCA Credit Union in Canada will share more about the lab's efforts to address these challenges. If any questions come into your mind as you listen to today's webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type those questions in there. Keith will answer them later in the hour as time allows. Also, this presentation is being recorded and it will be available later today on the World Council YouTube channel. I'll now turn things over to Keith Taylor. Keith, welcome. Thanks very much, Greg, and, and thanks uh, to the World Council of Credit Unions for having me here today. Really excited to share this opportunity with everyone uh, and share some of our thinking about uh, social value measurement. It really is an opportunity for credit unions to, to speak to what makes them different uh, in the market. And uh, we're really excited to, to share our work uh, and to hopefully have a bit of a discussion about how this lines up with the work that's underway uh, throughout, uh, throughout the credit union world. I know there has been a number of credit unions that have done some really interesting pioneering work in this, on this front as well. And I actually think there's a great opportunity for a collaboration. So before we get into that, I'm gonna share a little bit more about myself, a kind of a background in microfinance and, and community finance impact measurement. Uh, I've, I've worked, in the ESG world as well, developing corporate community investment standards for really all types of companies uh, from mining, energy, uh, pipelines, uh, believe it or not, uh, a really mixed bag, uh, you know, retailers, and, and in Canada, the big banks, uh, and also a lot of credit unions. So the nuances between the big bank world and the credit union world were, were always very different. Uh, I think the, the, the big bank world was very concerned with kind of submitting data to sustainability indices, putting together reports, alignment with the GRI, alignment with sustainability reporting standards uh, for obvious reasons, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit. But what I found interesting about the credit union world was that there was other pieces of information there that really don't fit into those frameworks like, very well and really required some heavy lifting to, to bring to the, the forefront, but tell an important story about what our sector contributes to the financial services world and the role we play in our, our communities that really isn't very well understood uh, amongst our, our markets and very amongst our, our customer base, but is a real great opportunity for credit unions to articulate what their value proposition actually is and to leverage that as, as the strength that it is. Uh, so, in addition to the, that, that background, uh, I also newly minted uh, incoming chair of Social Value Canada. So I have a, a stake in this, uh, in this world now uh, as well. So that's enough about me. I think what you'll get out of this, I'm hoping you get out of this, uh, this session is really just a high level understanding of what the opportunity actually represents when we talk about social value uh, and how to, how to measure that and articulate that as, as the credit unions we are. Uh, and where you can go to seek help with uh, and assistance with putting together that sort of analysis, what kind of standards are out there, what kind of organizations are available uh, to us to help do that work. And finally, I just want to kind of put out the, the opportunity for collaboration. I think there's opportunity within this work to create a common set of outcomes, 
the more we see other credit unions producing this sort of information, the more uh, you know widely understood it becomes, uh, and the more opportunity there is to to refine it. So, really interested in in sharing this work to get started. There is a little bit of heavy lifting, so the more we, uh, more collaboration that goes on, uh, you know, the the easier it comes, and the more scalable it becomes. So what we're going to cover today is, uh, you know, some introdu introductions and reflections on our journey to date, uh, our, the role of ESG information and credit unions, so the, the kind of opportunity in ESG and maybe some of the limitations of the widely adopted global frameworks and how we can supplement that with, with social value information, primarily when it comes to the S in ESG. It's really the, the, more, the more loosely defined element of, the, of most ESG frameworks. It's the area where there's the most runway for creativity and development. And it's really the area where credit unions have the most say. I think it's something that is a really important part of our story collectively. Uh, and developing some sort of, uh, de developing a more expanded framework for speaking to that element of the ESG world is, is a really important opportunity. Social value measurement is how we've uh, prioritized doing that. And, and I'm gonna to speak a little bit to that world and how it fits uh, into our strategy. Uh, I'm gonna give a tangible example of how we've used this work through one of our, our pilots uh, in the Duke Impact Lab and explain really what the Duke Impact Lab is uh, and, and the loan pilot that we've, uh, we're gonna use for this example uh, so you can understand the context and then talk a little bit about the opportunity for collaboration. So with that said, we'll, we'll dive right in. And I think everyone on the call should agree that uh, we are more than, bunch of, uh, more than a bunch of little banks. Uh, we, I say this, this line often, uh, and, it, and it's good just to be reminded of it. I find you know, the forces that come to bear in the credit union, our, our regulatory environment, I think the direction and the pressure is to become more like little banks. But the, what that misses is that the greatest potential for credit unions to have a social impact and to differentiate in the market for that matter is through their unique business model. We have a really unique structure. We operate differently than, than banks. We prioritize different things intuitively. I think there's a question of how to embed that uh, you know, in a more strategic, more portfolio driven uh, approach as we kind of make decisions about what to prioritize as institutions. Uh, and where to, to focus our bandwidth uh, is, uh, is an important opportunity. So I'll give you some context about uh, DUCA. Um, we have been around for about 70 years. We're a credit union in, uh, in Canada based in Ontario. We have about 90, we're just over 90,000 members actually now and a little bit over 7 billion in, uh, in assets. So we're one of the larger credit unions in Ontario, but not certainly not the largest. And the history of the credit union is, is an interesting one, and I'll explain it to you. And I'll give you the, the high level synopsis uh, of, the, of the trajectory. So, Duke itself actually started as a response to an inequity in the banking system. So, newcomer, there was a group of newcomers to Canada, arrived in Toronto, couldn't get access to basic banking services 70 years ago. They didn't have a lot of money in a lot of cases, they didn't have established credit histories. And at the time, that was a, a deal breaker for the, the large banks. And they struggled to get access to basic banking services. So they created their, their own bank. What's interesting about that story is a few things. Uh, a, that that inequity was there in the first place, but B, that we were able to kind of establish a community bank targeted at people that weren't supposed to be good banking customers on paper. Uh, in our first year, I think we had a few hundred dollars on the balance sheet and, and operated out of a, a living room just outside of, of Toronto. We're now a $7 billion financial institution. So that trajectory is an impressive business growth story. But what it really, uh, when you start to unpack it a little bit, we start to realize that, you know, that business growth story was largely built, especially in the, the early decades, on a customer base and our member base that weren't really supposed to be good banking customers. So when you start to reflect on it with that kind of a lens, you realize that the signals that are used to determine who's a good banking customer and who are, who's not uh, are imperfect at best. And if they're imperfect, if they're imperfect then, they're imperfect now. 
And if they're imperfect now, how do we create some space to play with some better signals? Uh, so that's why we created the, the Impact Lab. Uh, we had done a number of things from a social responsibility and a community impact perspective that were, were interesting, uh, but they're always kind of piecemeal projects. Uh, so we became like the first B Corp credit union globally. Uh, we became, uh, we launched the first social purpose mortgage product in, in, in Canada. We became Toronto's first living wage employer. There was a number of things that kind of put our, our values into motion, but what was missing was this thread that recognized that experimentation in modes of access and using inequity and addressing inequity as a design principle and innovation was really what had made Duca successfully and uh, successful. And it was what validated us in the market in the first place. And we really want to create space to build on that history as, as, we, as we move forward. So that's what the Impact Lab is. And my role at the credit union is as executive director of the Impact Lab. And what we do there is we take the lens of inequity uh, and access, and we design models of banking that provide credit to marginalized groups as a, as a design and innovation principle. So we've incorporated an arm's length uh, sub subsidiary to the, to the credit union, which is structured as in two parts. There's a, there's a charitable arm and there's a, there's a finance corporation that manages the, the loan pools. But what we do there is we come, we use community input to come up with opportunities to address an inequity or if there's a gap in the market and to design, use that input to design a solution. And then we test that solution uh, as, a, as a lender uh, so that we can understand what the risk is. And we really want to know only what the risk is and how much value this creates for uh, the borrowers and, and what the risk is to, to the institution. So we're not trying to earn a hurdle rate in three months at a time. We don't function traditionally like a, like, you know, a bank venture hub. It's really just concerned with piloting experiments that look at the question, what would banking look like if its primary focus was solving problems or creating opportunities? And once we understand that, we can figure out how it can be scaled, what the risk is, and uh, what value it creates uh, for our borrowers and for our community. So with that context, I think it's kind of clear why we would gravitate towards social value as a measurement framework in the first place because in order to know what value you're creating for the community it's important to to measure it uh, so that's become a key part of what we do at the the impact lab and it's something that we're planning to uh, build out as we go not only in the impact lab but uh, throughout the the credit union basically the impetus for this that I, I put forward as a you know as a global priority is to achieve the SDGs, that we're all working towards and credit unions play a really unique role in helping uh, our communities do this. But to achieve those SDGs, we need to put a more, we need to have different set of management information. We need a transformational shift in order to achieve a lot of these goals. And what's missing for a lot of institutions when it comes to management decision-making is the social value piece. If you're only looking at traditional metrics, you're only prioritizing, you know, traditional risk ROI type thinking and not having the social value element incorporated into that decision-making process, then you're really just going to end up with the same result. So the S in ESG represents an underutilized differentiator for credit unions, but must be measured to be managed. So before we get into the, uh, the social value nuts and bolts, I, I think what we're trying, it'd be useful to establish a definition of, of sustainability. So we look at sustainability as economic viability, environmental protection, and social equity. Uh, and the confluence of that for, for us as a credit union anyway, is really on the social equity uh, side and the economic viability uh, side of things. We looked at uh, our environmental footprint and like there is risk on the environmental side, but generally speaking, we don't have any money uh, invested in the energy sector from a treasury perspective. We don't really have a lot of risk exposure when it comes to environmental downside, but where we do have a lot of 
value to contribute is on the, the economic and, and social uh, equity uh, side of the sustainability spectrum. So when we think about ESG and the kind of way it's come to the market and the, the forces that's putting on us as an institution, we start to realize that ESG information was really intended to be a risk framework. It was meant to be a risk framework primarily to be consumed by people involved in raising capital, so either in public markets uh, or as institutional investors. It wasn't really designed to be used by consumers to make a decision, which kind of helps once we have established that context, kind of helped it kind of helps uh, appreciate why consumers tend to struggle to interpret this type of information from a just like a purchasing decision making perspective and how there's missing pieces when you think about it through that lens, uh, which I think social value helps us address. So the world of, of ESG information can be quite um, it can be complicated to, to newcomers. I think it's it's complicated to people that are looking at it for the first time. Uh, and really the frameworks that are out there serve different purposes. So you have, from a strategy perspective, I would say that's where the sustainable development goals and the global compact live. Uh, when you start to move down the spectrum from like strategy to management approach, to transparency, to governance, you see, you see different frameworks and different networks you could be part of, and they all serve slightly different purpose, but with a similar theme. So from a management approach perspective, we really start to gravitate towards social value internationals, uh, social value uh, guidance. It's a really interesting blend of how can you make this type of thinking embedded in your organization and use it for decision-making purposes, but also have an element of transparency. Um, we looked at like the GRI, for example, um, you know, hugely important uh, globally uh, as, a, as a mode for transparency and disclosure for you know, large public corporations and publicly traded corporations. Uh, for credit unions, and as we started to talk with more and more credit unions, particularly smaller scale ones, that like the GR framework was very difficult to execute on. Uh, it requires a lot of resource, a lot of data and an ongoing effort. And really, the, the audience for that type of information is, are those public markets, which generally speaking, at least in Canada, credit unions are not uh, trying to raise capital on. We, we don't issue uh, public securities um, or debts. The capital we raise is from our membership base. So that type of use case isn't quite as relevant. But what we need to do is kind of take the pieces of the risk framework in the GRI disclose them to our, to our membership base so they can make a better uh, decision on where to bank, but then also add in the value that we, we create. So uh, I think there's some really interesting uh, information that we use in, in our thinking. The biggest one uh, that comes from our auditor actually that shared this, uh, this data with us. So 61% of customers want more information to help, help make better sustainability choices. Um, and that really is on the companies uh, to produce. Uh, there, you can see evidence of it. I, th these types of stats are not new. Uh, if you've been following this type of market research, I, I would say since I started in this field like 15 years ago, you'd see similar types of you know percentage uh, type stats where you know consumers are saying we want more sustainable options and we factor it into decision making, but then at the end of the day, they don't actually. Um, so the complexity of information and how user friendly that information is, uh, hasn't, has kind of created a situation where consumers aren't fully able to, to put that impulse into motion and that desire into motion, but that the onus is on companies to produce that information and make it accessible. So the companies that can do that, I think are going to tap into that desire uh, to that, um, that level of priority that's being placed by consumers on this type of approach to business, but just wasn't really that accessible to them uh, in order to make a decision on a, on a scalable basis and that doesn't require a ton of bandwidth, a ton of research. So this type of information really important strategically to credit unions because we tick all those boxes. We just struggle to make the case so the challenge, uh, so ESG frameworks, as I said, report 
are, are, are primarily focused on risk uh, and evaluating the risk uh, in its management approach. So it's a ESG frameworks are basically a, like a long series of signals to stakeholders that we're aware of these risks, we're measuring them and we're managing them. What it doesn't do, in my opinion, is, is focus on impact. We can see changes. We can see uh, changes in performance when it comes to climate footprint. We can look at incremental improvements, but it's missing the, the stakeholder context often. And it doesn't really provide us a framework for accounting for value uh, and is limited to that risk that the organization plays uh, or, or the, the risk the organization essentially manifests in society, it doesn't really measure the risks or, or the value created by the organization for society. And there's a subtle difference there, but a really important one for credit unions. Because uh, generally speaking, we, as I said earlier, we don't pose a, a huge risk. We don't have like a, a lot of material disclosures uh, to make, but we do contribute a lot from a value perspective. So the evolving solution, we really prioritize work around developing uh, our social value measurement capacity. So introductions of social value in information to management decision making is, a, is an important opportunity uh, and one we're actively engaged in. The, ex the expansion of shared and country specific outcomes and data sets is a really important opportunity collectively. The producing social value information at the moment is a bit of a deep dive. Uh, and it does require some heavy lifting in the in the early stages. The more we can consolidate the learnings from that approach, uh, the the more scalable this approach becomes, uh, and the more collect uh, the more potential we have collectively to actually use this information on an ongoing basis. I think there's opportunity to integrate this uh, with sustainability information reporting and stakeholder communication. So, in addition to some of the risk based disclosures we need to make as institutions, having this part of the picture. Uh, is a key opportunity for, for credit unions. So when we start to think about the how of how to do this work and what resources are out there, I would suggest that the primary partner for this sort of work would be Social Value International or one of the national affiliates. So in Canada, we worked with, uh, with Social Value Canada quite closely throughout this process. Uh, there are similar national hubs around the world, and basically those hubs for, uh, form the basis of a, of a network. So they're kind of like a professional body, similarly what you would find in accounting uh, or other professional standards organizations. And they ensure that the, a consistent approach is followed so that the methodology is comparable, that the re results and the information that's produced by that methodology are comparable. Uh, and meaningful and, and credible. Uh, and it sets the standards and advocates for this sort of thinking and approach um, as it evolves throughout the, the world. And there's lots of interesting examples globally of this happening. Uh, in the credit union sector, it started to show signs of that as well. So there's, uh, I know a lot of interesting uh, examples coming out of the UK and Ireland. And I think you could see some interesting examples happening uh, in Australia and in Asia. There's starting to be some early adopters of this type of, of measurement work, which is really a, a great opportunity for credit unions to kind of organize around. So what does social value actually mean? Uh, the social value is ultimately about the well-being of people. So oftentimes, it, you know, the paraphrase we're valuing changes to well-being of our stakeholders. So we recognize positive and negative impacts on well-being and how important they are from the perspective of those who experience them. So it's a really important element to embed some measure of stakeholder perspective. Uh, stakeholder perspective kind of guides how we value the, the outcomes that, we're being, that are being achieved and really gives us insight in terms of how stakeholders are experiencing uh, the work done by organizations and, the, and feeling the impacts of that work. It provides a framework for accounting uh, for social value and, and, and ultimately to inform decision-making. I think you can look at this as a reporting vehicle, but where it really starts to become important uh, and, and impactful is if you can get to a point where you can have this be part of your, your team and your organization's decision-making, how we look at risk, uh, and how we look at prioritizing uh, our initiatives, having that be part of the management dashboard uh, and how we evaluate success. 
has a bunch of domino effects uh, and a really important opportunity and really is the focus, I think, of Social Value International is, is how to embed this information in decision making, uh, because then it takes on a life of its own. So social return on investment is a way of measuring uh, social value, and it looks at creating a ratio that's easy to understand. So a lot of business people especially uh, will gravitate towards return on investment sort of thinking uh, and can easily process that information across a diverse range of activities. So social, social return on investment really takes that same sort of framework and easy to understand and easy to compare approach uh, and looks at the amount of social value you create per dollar invested. So you end up at the end of the day with a ratio. I'll show you uh, kind of what we ended up with in our example, uh, but it helps stakeholders under, understand the value of, of the initiative and the, and the impact that you, and the value of the impact that, uh, that you're having. So it's, it's a tool within the social value world uh, for getting to that level of understanding and incorporating it into your, your decision-making process, which we've gravitated to. Uh, it's not the only tool, but it's uh, it's a really great way to embed it into that decision making, as I mentioned. So the principles of social value. Uh, so as I said, one of the most important things, and I guess in this uh, in this framework, it is the most important thing, is to involve stakeholders. You want to know what their perspectives are. You want to have a formalized way for them to have input on how we're valuing these outcomes. And also really to give us a lens on understanding what changes for them. Uh, you know, when we're talking about financial institutions, we have a bunch of well-articulated ways and standardized ways for understanding the value we create for ourselves. We really don't have a lot of ways of understanding the value we create for everybody else. Uh, and this, this type of thinking really helps us fill in that remaining piece, which for credit unions is so important. So understanding what changes, involving your stakeholders, extremely important uh, and really helps us value the things that that matter. Uh, so, you know, we, we don't want to decide what matters. We need others to tell us so that we can value them appropriately uh, and only include what is material to those, uh, to those stakeholders and, and to the organization. So the materiality you'll find throughout ESG frameworks, really important concept. It's important in social value thinking as well. Uh, transparency, I think, also extremely important. If uh, ESG has come under criticism uh, in, in some ways, it's because there's a lack of transparency, there's a lack of standardization. Uh, people are questioning the data that's being disclosed and how it was calculated. This is an important element for social value thinking as well. Uh, and not overclaiming, uh, not exaggerating the results uh, being, you know, conservative in how we get to the value created and verifying that result uh, through either a verification or um, certification process with someone like Social Value International or other uh, standards bodies that are, are doing that sort of work in, in your country. There's, there's many national hubs, as I, I mentioned off the top. And ultimately, to, to be responsive to, to input. I think when, one of the things that struck me about our work in this area is the ongoing evolution of, of stakeholder feedback and how we look at the full picture of the value that we're creating. Uh, so betting in that into the process, really important, um, which again, speaks to the whole stakeholder journey. So I'll give you an example. I think that's very theoretical so far. I, and uh, hopefully uh, hopefully it was clear. I'll, I'll give you an example of some of the Impact Labs work in the escalator loan uh, and our SROI journey. So. As I mentioned off the top, it comes from a, a lens on appreciating the role of credit unions. And this speaks to the Canadian context, for example, because um, that's where we operate. But if you look at the evolution of banking in Canada, credit unions actually led the way on a number of fronts. Uh, community insights have always driven credit union innovation here. We we're the first to offer banking services directly to women. Uh, we were the first bi-weekly mortgage payments, so the first to uh, offer ATMs, the first internet banking, early adopters of, of uh, socially responsible investment. There's a number of innovations that happened in the credit union sector because of community insight and connection to community, and because we had a way of incorporating that community-based feedback into how we operated as businesses that had become commonplace 
uh, that seemed different at the time, but have become commonplace in the market. And it really just speaks to the innovation opportunity when you have that sort of information flowing. Uh, there's a lot that you can do, and there's a lot of ways you can differentiate uh, in the market, serve your, not only serve your members better, but also facilitate, you know, wider spread adoption of, of the innovations that you're producing. So that's one of the ideas behind the Duke Impact Lab. So what we do is we, we research, we have a, a stakeholder feedback loop with community organizations, fintechs, a broad range uh, that inform what type of initiatives and what type of experiments we want to run. We run some research into the state of fair banking practices in Canada, where we compare consumer perceptions of fairness in the banking system to uh, perceptions of people that work in the banking system and identify uh, the gaps and run a compare and contrast analysis uh, sort of study, which has produced some really interesting insights into how we prioritize our, our pilots. You know, our, our research initiatives and pilots focus on underbanked entrepreneurs. Uh, we've done some work in co-op buyouts. We've done some work uh, and are starting to do more work in gig economy and freelance worker finance uh, and underbanked and underrepresented consumers, generally speaking, uh, which is probably the, the nature of the example I'm gonna use for the purposes of this presentation. But what we do is we take those up, we take those insights into where the opportunities are we design the solutions and then we run some business planning and, and provide the seed capital to understand how we can prove the concept and actually get some momentum happening. So once we have that, we're able to then look at the distribution channel, scale the distribution, scale the capital, produce some actual risk modeling so that we can facilitate that that scale up uh, and and ultimately be able to pursue a capital raise to, to help really define the risk profile uh, and the impact that we're having in these innovations and see if they can be scaled in a mainstream institution so at the far end of the spectrum that starts to become more as a conversation with boards and regulators but by that point, we have the data to actually have those conversations in detail, and it helps us it helps enable that type of innovation in uh, in the mainstream institution. So, the example I'm going to use is something that we call the escalator loan pilot, and it's not it's meant to target people in trouble with payday loans debt originally, but has become really an all purpose tool for people that are. Um, struggling with predatory debt of all sorts. And it's really not a payday loans alternative. Payday loans alternatives are about quick access to cash, like replicating the payday loans model uh, and solving an immediate problem. What we do is we work with people that are in trouble with predatory debt and provide them with a way out of that situation and a model that helps them avoid falling back into the trap. So slightly different. You can't walk into a Duke branch and get an escalator loan in five minutes. It's something that we work through a cash flow analysis pro process uh, and provide as it's kind of a, a more like a consolidation loan sort of process. So there's a 30 month maximum. There's a prime plus eight uh, interest rate. But what's interesting is that there's a rebate structure. So we actually rebate a significant portion of that interest for successful borrowers at the end of the term. So if you make all your payments on time and you do everything you say you're going to do, you actually get a good portion of that interest uh, back. So it becomes a prime plus four loan, uh, which even at prime plus eight, it's unbeatable in the market, but uh, at prime plus four, it's a particularly good deal. The ticket size cap is, is 18,000 uh, overall. We can consolidate multiple loans within that 18,000, uh, but that's that's where we, we, we have to draw the line. Uh, Prepayments, you can pay out at any time. There's no penalty. Um, so there, you can really move on from it whenever you're you're ready. And the idea is when you build your credit profile, you build some savings, you have a more manageable cash flow uh, model, uh, and it makes you less likely, uh, combined with the, the influx of cash at the end of the term, makes you less likely to get into that situation in, in future because you're embedding the right financial behaviors uh, in your ongoing cash flow management uh, strategy. So it's for people that are in trouble with predatory debt, with low credit score and and credit uh, and credit options in the mainstream are limited. So generally, it's sub 600 uh, borrowers. Although with the the way interest rates have changed, that started to creep up a little. Uh, but it's generally people that wouldn't be successful uh, applying for credit in a mainstream institution of any sort. So that's 
the the model that's the context uh, so the questions we're trying to ask when we get into social value analysis is from a measurement perspective what or who changes how does it or do they change how do we know the change has occurred and would something else have changed if this change didn't happen so that's the starting point and once we understand that piece of the picture that kind of gives us the outcomes or a way of measuring which changes we want to prioritize, which changes are important to stakeholders, and which changes can be valued. The valuation part comes in where we start to put an economic value to those changes. We use the, the outcomes by the financial proxies, proxies and then you know discounted based on uh, stakeholder feedback. So the valuation is what changes are most important and to whom, how much change was there, how much is it valued and by whom? Uh, how long will the value of the change last? Uh, is all of the change because of us? So it's a really important one. We wanna know what our relative role in enabling that change was, because that prevents us from overstating uh, and overclaiming what we've contributed. And there might what might have been the alternative outcome? So for us, it's been a bit of a journey. I think for most people it would be. Uh, especially in the early days, uh, it, developing that framework of outcomes, developing the financial proxies that you need to make that valuation is a process. I think we've found that a lot of, uh, there's a lot of financial proxies that actually did exist for non-financial services related outcomes, but a lot of the infl financial inclusion uh, proxies that we uh, wanted to use were really not available to us in Canada. So in the first iteration, we used, uh, we essentially converted proxies from the UK into Canadian dollars and used that as a way of establishing our initial forecast, which when we looked at all the changes that were occurring in the escalator loan and uh, was came up to be about $12 in value for every $1 in cost. The next step, the next step would be uh, the development of Canadian uh, financial proxies, which is what we're doing now. So there's a certain amount of looking at government data from StatsCan. We engaged a firm called Symmetrica Jacobs uh, in the UK, has done some leading work internationally on uh, the valuation approach, and they've helped us develop a framework that uses Canadian data to get to a similar set of of outcomes. So. The drivers of value that we've identified are not radically different than in the first iteration. We've just been able to value those uh, in a bit of a different way and in a more precise way uh, for the Canadian market. So most of the value drivers uh, come from mental health changes. So we're leaving the mental health strain of high cost debt. We're using um, you know, mental health uh, oriented financial proxies and, the, and particularly related to the role that financial stress plays on mental health as a value driver. So the biggest uh, the biggest value driver here obviously is, is, is subjective and subjective financial outcomes and it would be the elimination of negative expectations and just a, like the overall sense of well-being. There's also improved mental health, uh, there's stress reduction, uh, and there's indirect benefits such as physical health changes, improved eating habits, physical health. We're adding to this framework, I think over time, the capacity of, of the borrowers to participate in the economy, both as an employee, so in, in terms of absence rates and uh, abilities to start businesses. There's a kind of areas we're adding to the framework based on the, on the feedback we're getting, but this is uh, the starting point of version 2.0. And it gives you a sense of where we're seeing these uh, these drivers of value occur uh, and where we're going to be focusing our efforts on, on cultivating the model as, as we go. So the use case uh, is more than just reporting. We have the obvious stakeholder communications and, and demonstrating value piece of it. And I've obviously positioned it that way as a, as a tool for supplementing your, your ESG reporting and speaking to that S. But it also has a lot of value, uh, and I've started to realize this relatively recently, to government. Uh, there's a lot of shared well-being focus on uh, government regulators uh, from government regulator standpoint, uh, and this type of information. 
really interesting government relations opportunity and an obvious member relations opportunity and a really good response from our members knowing that we do this sort of work and that we're not just you know making a bunch of donations to random things we're actually using the business model of the credit union to have an impact on our communities which resonates really well the other piece that's underappreciated and probably the, the biggest area of opportunity uh, is the planning, performance, and decision-making part of it. So using this information from a prioritization and planning perspective, and also forecasting out and measuring our performance from a social value perspective um, has huge potential as an organization and a really big driver of, of differentiated innovation and, and differentiation as a brand. Being able to articulate that and Financial services in Canada is really important for credit unions because it's so dominated by the big banks. Uh, they, they eat up such a, a broad range of, of bandwidth uh, in our market. Being able to share a different set of information and our, speak to the value that we contribute and the role we play in a different way is a huge differentiation opportunity. Stakeholder feedback loops. Uh, are a key part of that process. So the more we can get data flowing from stakeholder groups, the better we are at innovating. And that data flow is a key part of being able to do this analysis and expand this analysis throughout the credit union. Uh, value gaps and identification. We can understand part the parts of the model that are doing what we want them to do and, the, and generating the value that we want to generate. But it also helps us understand where we're falling a bit short, where we need to improve. It gives us a really specific lens on where we're working, where we're achieving what we want to achieve and where we're not, and giving us an opportunity to fix those, those deficiencies. It gives us an opportunity to continually improve uh, and also ultimately offers us a lens for design that's very different than what we'd see in our competing institutions. So I mean, settle that, the opportunity to collaborate is, is definitely there. I think while the Financial proxies piece tends to be more nationally focused. This context is, is very important. Um, the outcomes that are measured to get to that valuation are fairly comparable. And I know a number of credit unions in the world have done some interesting work in the space as well. Putting together a bit of a, a working group or some mode of collaboration, particularly on the outcomes that are used and measured as part of the part of the social value measurement process, really important. So uh, it doesn't exist right now to my knowledge. I think there's national networks that collaborate. There's national social value banks that are sharing financial proxies so that this analysis can be done at scale. But what it does what really isn't happening as far as I can see is the sharing of outcomes and sharing of practices, particularly in a credit union sort of environment which would be really useful for scaling because this sort of analysis isn't limited to the one example I gave. It's, it's really an opportunity across a lending portfolio at a credit union. We have lots of programs and, and functions in the credit union that foster better financial literacy that are helping people improve their cash flow, their ability to save. I bet you every credit union on this call has a portfolio of activities that achieve those sorts of outcomes. Part and parcel of that is all these improvements in mental health, these access to better childcare, access to better educational opportunities, improved personal safety uh, and physical health. It's really all linked and we do it at scale as part of our credit union business model. It's just not something that we value fully all the time and are able to articulate to the market uh, as well as we need to. So, Really like the idea of this collaboration opportunity. Uh, I'm hoping we can have a bit of a conversation about it, but if not today, we can talk about it uh, offline. I put my contact information up here. Uh, love to hear from anyone on the call uh, and love to hear any thoughts on this, uh, this collaboration idea. Really looking at this as a, a first step at, at validating this impulse, but uh, I'm, I'm really kind of curious to hear your, your thoughts. So. That's uh, that's the end. I can try to. I see there's some questions in the in the Q and A. Yeah, Keith, I was going to say that uh, 
I've been doing, I've done dozens of these for World Council of Credit Unions. I've never seen as many questions as we have for you um, on this oh. topic. So <laughs> first, so thank you, really enlightening um, presentation. And if you, if, if you don't mind, let's get to some of those because uh, it really is a, a lot of questions here for you. We'll start with one uh, who someone asked that they, they said they'd love to hear more about Duca's social impact mortgage and how it's structured. Can you go into that a little bit without, I guess, getting too detailed? Yeah. Well, at a high level, it's partnership between, um, we had a, a charitable partner that was focused on affordable housing development in, in our area. I think they would operate pretty globally and be well-known globally They're called Habitat for Humanity. Uh, and basically it's a, it's a very simple structure. You know, we contribute, we have a joint branding relationship with, uh, with Habitat and we contribute a portion of the of the spread that's earned on those on those mortgage on that mortgage portfolio to them. So there's no difference in the cost uh, from a rate perspective to the borrower. We just take a portion of, of the spread that's earned in that portfolio and uh, make a donation to Habitat so they can build homes with that uh, with that money. Wow, that's that's an awesome initiative. Um, Yvonne asks, could you please share information about your main faults during the implementation of ESG standards and what ESG KPIs in a credit union you would recommend to avoid? Oh, uh, well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So I, it's not so much the metrics to avoid, it's, it's the process to get there. I, I, I think what held it back for the longest time was focusing on, on full alignment uh, to these public market oriented uh, frameworks and the reason there, the reason there's hesitancy to pursue that sort of reporting in credit unions is just scale, uh, and also the use case for that information. Like I worked in the reporting world, I even and I and I know I and I advised people in large institutions uh, about their reporting. And basically, the conversation that's occurring behind the scenes is that that information takes a ton of time to produce, uh, a ton of resources to produce. Uh, and really, the the people that read it are just ESG ratings companies, so a very limited audience. It's not, it's not a knock on ESG, and I'm not an ESG detractor by any stretch. But for a credit union, that's that's kind of a hard thing to digest. So what we did was we gravitated more to the B Corp framework because a lot of the same sort of principles were there. Um, it has its downsides as well, obviously, but really it gave us a way of producing a similar sort of verification that where our management practices are where we want them to be uh, and some sort of way of benchmarking against our peers without really putting an undue burden on on the team for producing a report that uh, a very limited audience would actually read so i'm very interested in the the information uh, that's accessible to our membership and to our communities probably more than uh, a box checking exercise from a, an ESG perspective. Oscar asks that, he says the ROI is interesting to translate into real impact for our members. So this PSV, how did you get to implement that as part of your corporate strategy? Sorry, they, they cut out a little bit on my end. Can you repeat that question? Sure, I'm sorry about that. Uh, he said the ROI is interesting and in how it translates into a real impact for members. And then he writes, so this PSV, how did you get to implement that as part of your corporate strategy? PSV. Uh, so, uh, okay. So how it became part of the corporate strategy is still an ongoing process. I think what we're doing is building out the framework in lending portfolios where the, the, there's the most obvious uh, social impact and we're able to value that kind of change most readily. Uh, what we're looking to do now is like taking the learnings from that, hoping to collaborate with others on the learnings they have from their journey so far, uh, and mapping those out to other parts of the of the portfolio of activity at the credit union, and uh, evolving it over time. So I wouldn't say it's fully embedded. It's uh, it's a journey that we're on. Uh, and we're looking for institutions that are, are, want, are desiring to go on a similar journey, I suppose. 
This is kind of a, a simple question, but it, it probably is something that a lot of credit unions may look at and say, who do we turn to? Who do you consider a stakeholder? Who do we consider a stakeholder? Um, so I would say mo the most obvious question is, uh, and probably the most important stakeholder is your, your membership base. Uh, but we would also have a broader stakeholder community in the financial health and financial literacy uh, world in Canada and the social finance world and in the banking world. Um, so our, our regulators are an obvious one, uh, but impact investment, funds and programs and loan programs, uh, financial literacy advisors, financial counselors, debt counselors, um, really anyone, uh, we, we take a fairly broad view of it. Uh, the, the, other, the other group we are interested in, in hearing from is uh, the FinTech community. Uh, so there's, a, there's the, I'd say those are probably the, the higher priority ones, but uh, we, we, we're in the midst of expanding that, uh, that network. That question came from Bob. Um, Fentahun asks, which social value are you referring to? And, and this is a complicated question, but is the social value mm. structural, relational, or cognitive? It could be, well, it could be, it could touch on all of those things. I, I think there, there's value in terms of, you know, I, 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 but I would say in the example I gave, it's mostly focused on the improvements in health and mental health. I, I would say those are the biggest drivers. And, and the, addition, the thing I would add to that is the improvements to just outlook and perceptions of well-being, which seems like kind of a fair, like an airy, fairy sort of concept, but it's actually an important driver of decision-making and behavior uh, in individuals. So uh, like there's, and there's a clear link to social value calculation and, you know, your ability to perceive hope, for example, uh, or, or your ability to feel like you're achieving what you want to achieve and that you have some agency over your life is, is an important driver of positive decision making. Uh, and like that's an element to it as well. You mentioned that escalator loan model. Er Ernesto said he, you know, we could agree that providing social value is important for the co-ops. Do you have any other examples of including social value in financial products? I think it's an area, I think it's a relatively new area. I could see lots of examples in the nonprofit space. I could see lots of use cases in government in terms of like purchasing. Um, there's the Social Value Act in the, in the UK from a, you know, from a government perspective. But in financial services, it's a relatively new area. And I think when we, when you started promoting this era, this uh, session today, I heard from a number of, of folks that are in institutions that are doing something similar. Uh, and I just think it's such an easy fit for, for credit unions uh, that addresses that gap. I, I, what I see from across the, the credit union board is like some gaps in ESG reporting, but rightly so. Uh, but then this other piece of information, uh, just not there at all. And I, I, I think there's, it's interesting to see the early adopters come online and start doing this sort of valuation. Uh, and I'd love to see more of it and play a role in, in kind of fostering that uh, process or contributing to it however we can. You had mentioned earlier um, who the stakeholders are, that who you consider the stakeholders to be. Um, Oscar also asks, how do you align those main stakeholders to adopt a real sponsorship of the frameworks and philosophy that you're talking about? In uh, the early stages and the proof of concept stages, the, we, you, we take involvement from those stakeholder groups. So in the early stages of the escalator loan, for example, we had a national debt counselor involved, not only in the design, but actually the distribution of that loan product from a, a proof of concept perspective. Um, so the information we were at, we were able to gather from that community was, was much different and it gives us kind of a, a certain amount of, of, of credibility in our intentions, uh, and helps us, it, it helped us a lot, uh, iterate on the model. Uh, so we had like an ongoing touch point. They were involved in the process throughout the rollout. We were involved in, 
in in tweaking and iterating the model as we rolled it out, uh, and it ultimately ended in, in a better place. So there was a, there was an interesting opportunity to kind of embed them in the actual delivery of the of the business or the product, um, and that's I guess the best answer, uh, and that enabled us to have a different sort of conversation with the rest of that community. I think they saw involvement from a leading organization in that field, and uh, you know it opened some doors to some conversations and uh, some input uh, or feedback loops as well. Uh, another question, this is interesting to me, Duca Labs seems to have a high tolerance for risk. Has there been relational assessment done? And now my, my question just jumped around here. Give me one second here. Uh, has there been, sorry. Oh, I see what you mean. So uh, like the social value calculation. Yeah, has really, there been relational guess, assessment done between expected credit loss and social value measurement? Yeah, well, that's ultimately what we're trying to achieve. I don't think one causes the other, uh, but we're trying to evaluate in uh, in tandem. The reason we're able to take on a different risk profile is that we've created a, a like an innovation arm that's essentially at arm's length from the credit union. Um, so it contains the risk within that entity and gives us the flexibility to experiment in a different way so that we're not putting our members' capital at risk uh, or and, and we're containing the scope of, of the experiment uh, and we're able to do some different things as a result. But I would say we haven't noticed a direct link between social value and credit risk. We have noticed that you can do both uh, and, and in a scalable way. Uh, the, for the escalator loan example in particular, you know, the credit risk is palatable, probably considered uh, you know, in, comparable to its credit card portfolio. Uh, but the social value is quite substantial. Uh, so I don't know if there's a cause and effect relationship there yet, it, it, but it, it doesn't appear to be one. Uh, Linda says, great presentation. And she says, with your invitation to collaborate, what specific areas would you see as the greatest areas of collaboration that would be the most beneficial? For instance, launching a common product to test and learn, a depository of common metrics. What would be your recommendation? Well, both of those things, actually. I, I think... Um, so we're interested in collaborating with uh, credit unions on on product development. I think we can we have a, a really unique structure um, and innovation, in, at least in Canada and credit unions, tends to be hampered by the scale of the institutions uh, a lot of the time. So creating some sort of collaborative joint approach to innovation, uh, I think, is actually a really compelling opportunity. So I could see product innovation collaborations happening. In fact, like we we have some early signs that. Uh, that will be happening uh, shortly, but would love to include institutions that are interested in that uh, approach. But for the purposes of this presentation, really, really just thinking, you know, a, a depository of, out, uh, of outcomes. We see examples of that in other fields. Like there's a, they're called value banks, and they generally operate nationally. So you have a sport value bank. The Australian Social Value Bank is a really well developed one. Um, you can see uh, there's purchasing uh, social value banks and the value bank is really just a depository of financial proxies uh, to enable this sort of analysis. Um, so I could see collaboration on both fronts. Uh, do you, Deepak asks, how are we rating social values in a credit union? I mean, is there is there a scale of what's more important than something else? I think that's up to the, it's, it's kind of up to what the credit union wants to achieve. I don't know if there's a collective vision for how that should unfold, uh, but what this type of information gives you is an opportunity to have that conversation. Um, so I, I don't know if I would like put forward a specific guidance on that. It's really just about building the capacity to, to know what it looks like and to have that conversation as a group and figure out what's a, what the best fit for it is for your community and your membership base. Um, Allison asks, what do you see as the next steps to credit unions collaborating in this space? Uh, I would see the, the next steps, if you're interested, would just shoot me an email. I'd love to have a conversation. I, I think the, um, there's lots of areas that credit unions could collaborate on uh, and produce you know, some scalable lending models in particular. Uh, for you know, gig economy workers, uh, renters, like for generally marginalized groups, um, are a great place to. It sounds terrible, but it's a great place to experiment because you really understand 
the machinations of, of lending uh, when you're looking at uh, at high risk groups, and, and it gives you if you can make it work there, you can figure out how to scale a bit, uh, scale it elsewhere. So, really, the next steps I think is collaborative innovation for our sector. Um, it opens up some possibilities that institutions on their own would not be able to pursue. And I think there's lots of evidence that they haven't been able to pursue it because it's really not happening to the degree that it should. Keith, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we'll let you go. Uh, it's from Dahlia. She says, do you have resources to share on the selection of ESG indicators that are relevant for credit unions, either standard indicators or examples of use useful custom indicators? Well, the useful custom indicators, I would say, approach your uh, approach your local social value network uh, and and develop those custom ind indicators in partnership with people that uh, are knowledgeable of the methodology and know how to to build out those frameworks. Um, so I, that's a message I would like to pass on. But in terms of ESG guidance, it's really just rooted. I'd, I'd see what I see absent in a lot of ESG approaches at, at credit unions is a really good materiality process. And I, and I don't think materiality process looks like a scan of GRI reports from banks. I, I think a, GR, a, a materiality process from, from an ESG perspective in the credit union world has a really well-developed feedback loop with the membership base, uh, with their community and with their peers in the sector. I don't see a lot of that happening. Um, so in the, in the absence of giving you advice on specific metrics, I would say that approach is really important and uh, is an area of opportunity for the sector as well. And we wrote it in the chat. There are still some questions outstanding, but there's a lot of them. We can't get to all of them, but ktaylor at duca.com, D-U-C-A.com, yep. that's your email? That's my email. All right, so if you have any questions for Keith, please be, um, uh, be sure to email him and he will respond to those. Um, and again, if you like this event, you wanna watch it again, you wanna get more out of this, uh, or if you'd like others in your credit union to see it, you can refer them to the World Council YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Woku. The recording of this in both English and Spanish is going to be available there later today. And if you feel like you got a lot out of this presentation and you want to be part of more sessions like this, but in person next time, you can still register for our 2023 World Credit Union Conference. We're going to be co-hosting it with the Canadian Credit Union Association from July 23rd to the 26th in Vancouver, Canada. You still have one more week until July 5th to register online at wcuc.org. That is wcuc.org. Great presentation. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a great day.